We're here today at this 100-year-old decommissioned power plant because it represents a perfect example of engineering prowess. It's not only prowess, it's beauty. I mean, look at the curved arches on the top of these windows and look at the sculptural elements of the generators themselves. Why did men do this? If we look back 100,000 years at people that made stone tools, the stone tools themselves had so much over-design in them beyond their functionality. I think that's fascinating. In our DNA is this spirit of working together with women. To work together to thrive on an equal playing field. To live and breathe together. In our culture today, men have accumulated a tremendous amount of power. I mean, look at this piece of machinery. This, this machine harnesses water flowing down from a mountain, runs it through a turbine, and turns a generator that powers an entire city. But they've left the women out. What happened? I'm committed to walking out of this shadow, walking out of this hopefully dying culture and build a new culture that represents what's coded in our DNA that allows us to feel each other. Men and women trusting each other that we've come together equally. My commitment is to reestablish that feeling, that visceral primal feeling of connection with ourselves and our partner and our community that allows us to become our full selves and our full expression for who we want to be. That's what I'm committed to. My name's Chris Hoffman. Heart and Gear is my platform for social change. I'm on a mission to change the culture that we're stuck in. Rhino Motors is my company that is implementing that social change right now. We're a product engineering and licensing company that is delivering the future we were promised. Our primary product is the one-wheeled motorcycle. You've probably seen this online, two, 22 million views on YouTube videos. It's a total geek fest. But what's beautiful about this product is it allows people to immerse themselves in their environment and mingle with people and have an experience of wanting to protect their environment. What we're gonna do for the water is what the Rhino did for urban. So now we've got a, a, an all-electric hydrofoil personal watercraft that drops into this, the jet ski market. And the jet ski market is, this, is where these vehicles have been banned in most of the inland waterways because they're so obnoxious and so you know, stinky and loud. But this product will go 35 miles an hour, no wake. You can blow out to the whales and drop down and cruise around and have an experience with your environment that allows you to feel like you're protecting the environment. So the strategy of this company is to design products that change people's lives for the better. The Rubric car is a little urban parking solution. 30% of people are driving around in the city trying to find a place to park. None of this electric technology that's being developed today gets cars off the freeway. Nothing about the electrification of our transportation system is going to save time. 30% of the people driving around for parking is a problem we can solve. It's not glamorous, but this car is like a little bumper car for the urban landscape. It gives people a chance to ride in an SUV driving style. You pull up to your destination and get out, and it goes and parks itself in a parking structure with a little bit of autonomous driving. I mean, my, my personal opinion, autonomous driving is never going to happen. Not the cars, not the trucks, it's too complicated. And it doesn't do anything to increase our standard of living. This car 
at five or 10 miles an hour takes off the, the parking problem. And, and it, at night, I can drive this around and deliver packages. So it's, it's a solution that's trying to change our lifestyle. And on top of that, Rhino Motors is committed to a living wage supply chain. How do I take $200 off retail and put it at the very beginning of a supply chain and change people's lives? So what's, what's the anarchy of innovation? I mean, I've been called a, an innovation anarchist. So what does that mean? What it means is you have to take it all the way back to the history of evolution. And, and when we stood up, when Lucy stood up and had a pair of hands in front of us, our brains didn't get bigger over time. Our brains got bigger to take full advantage of the reality that our hands were creating. So what are we going to do with those hands? These hands eventually evolved and went from a stone tool, which was a brick, to something that is so sophisticated and so highly refined in the dexterity of our hands that it ended up being a sign of status. And the status metric was, however heavy my stone tool is, is what's subtracted from the food I can bring back. So what I've got today is an exact replica of the Utah Clovis Point. This is the highest level of innovation 13,000 years ago in the United States. It's beautiful. Look how thin, perfectly symmetric. The mastery to produce this stone tool is phenomenal. So what, what tool do we have today that represents this same level of metric gauged on thinness? The smartphone. Why is this like this? It's coded in our DNA. It's who we are. We're innovators. We build stuff that makes people's lives better. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is when the history of evolution got to a point where we've got these tools, we've got the mastery, and we look at motion and still thinking, is that food or is that a threat? And I believe it was women that stood up and said, why? What's the motivation of that motion? What's the intent of what that is? And when that moment happened, women became the custodian of why. That question, put together with mastery, becomes myth, dance, and art. Think about that for a minute. Mastery together with why creates art. So without why, all we're stuck with is what and how. In our culture today, the what and how is all men really do. And unless they open themselves to be influenced by the why, it's sort of like peacocking. So in the animal kingdom, when there's males and females both have equal access to resources, the males have nothing but their feathers to make an erotic display except the bowerbird. There's this ugly little bird in New Guinea that has no peacocking feathers. And what he does is he builds this above ground nest, this erotic display to the females, and then he stands in front of it with this unattached presentation to be judged for who he is. And if a channel opens up, they come together. Malcolm Thayer, the designer of the Jaguar XKE, had to have felt something in his body. It's not, and an engineer just doesn't make stuff shiny. You, you have to feel some resonance in your body and then recreate it in sheet metal. The Jaguar is his own erotic bower. 
Though in our culture today, peacocking is backwards. Men don't want to be naturally selected. So they've marginalized women to the point where women have to actually present themselves to men and be judged. And the problem today is now that women have actually regained access to resources and men expect them to peacock and they don't owe men jack shit. Men get angry. So it's not about equal pay. It's about women having equal access to the decision-making influence in our culture as the custodian of why. So as innovators, and it doesn't matter what gender you are, if you take the role of creator and you find something that is taking the role of, of challenge you on your why, all we can do is find out who we are and access something special about ourselves and present it in an unattached Bowerbird presentation to the question of why and shut up and let that experience of why have their own experience with your offer. That's a vulnerable thing for the creator to do. That's scary. But that's what's missing in our culture right now is the capacity to just present yourself at whatever level of evolution you are at at that moment and be judged by the question of why. So if we can't come together and balance the what and how with the why, we're never going to be able to build a culture that allows us all to thrive together. So I'm going to talk about innovation and what I think is wrong with innovation in our culture. Innovation, the way Silicon Valley does it, the way a lot of companies do it, is a race to the bottom on price. We're trying to create systems that take the cost out of things at somebody else's expense. Automation is different than oppression. Automation, I can build tools and make my job easier. I can produce more things per person. But oppression is simply marginalizing wages and slave laboring people to a point where we extract resources from someplace else and raise our own standard of living. So we have to be careful as consumers on what we're buying and what we're participating in and what kind of supply chain it has behind it. That's why I'm standing up for a living wage supply chain, because customers can influence what happens. So the, in, the innovation is, that, that bothers me the most is you know, autonomous driving, total waste of money, creating all these little fancy blingy shiny things to sell to people. We should, be, we should be creating platforms and software that allows people to collaborate. Software that looks like an, a utility. Software that's reliable, that all people can rise together. So who's going to lead this conversation? There's a lot of people here, I'm sure, that are, are, are highly skilled and, and would love to get together with other people, but we have to start getting together and collaborating and building systems with the human component in the system of what we're building. So to close my talk, my favorite line, it's not about the product that you force on the market. It's the how you allow yourself to be changed by the act of creation. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Give it